What are the odds that Harry doesn't show up? <laughs> mm, I was just thinking that. Uh, I'm going to lay down. Just going to rest my eyes a little bit. <laughs> Flash to Harry, wiling out on his one wheel. <laughs> perfect, perfect weather for it. He shows up on your doorstep sometimes, right? Yeah. Les will uh, text me. She's like, I think I just saw Harry stop by. And then uh, he scurries away before I can even get to the door, try and say hi. That's not weird at all. I know. That sounds like a really good, like, Mike Myers 90s comedy, like, my, the boss or something. <laughs> oh, well, to what do we owe the pleasure? Hi. Hi, we were just making fun of you. <laughs> oh, good. Wanted to say, by the time you hear this, we we will have released our Wednesday Warehouse podcast where we covered some of the events, but we totally forgot to talk about our Monday issue of, you know, the, the title that was Government Smackdown 2023. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of chicanery, shit cannery going on. A few people pointed out, even one major distributor, that one thing I neglected to put in was that distributors themselves holding craft brands, especially hostage, not letting them leave when they want to, and also just not making an effort to sell them, just kind of sitting on them is also a problem. Because, you know, in my mind, most distributors don't do that, but there are a significant amount that do, and it is shitty. And that just creates ill will and um, is a bad look for the industry and it's anti-competitive. So I'm done lecturing the entire industry for the week. <laughs> I, I think I've done enough lecturing. When Dave Infante picks it up and carries it, then you, you know I'm on the right track. <laughs> uh, uh, and shout out to the folks at Brewbound as well who mentioned it on their podcast. Appreciate that. All right. So why don't we let Jean-Hohan, as Jen, Jen, why don't you introduce? <laughs> Jeff Hanson. <laughs> Guests who don't know our esteemed guest today, welcome to BeerNet Radio, where all your dreams come true. Today, we have Jeff Hansen, who is co-founder and CEO of multi-state specialty wholesaler Scout Distribution, as well as Harlan Brewing Co. based in San Diego. And many of you know Jeff. He's an industry vet. You know, he's been with St. Archer, Coronado, long CPG beverage experience. I think you were at Boston and Pepsi, too, for a bit. So uh, yeah, today we're mostly going to bug you about Scout, which had a very eventful past year. You know, the fall announcement of the JV with Columbia to enter Idaho. And today you guys operate as a total beverage wholesaler in SoCal, Arizona, and Idaho doing what, like a couple million cases? Yeah, we'll be just, just under 2 million cases this year. Let's start there, right? Let's talk about the Columbia JV to enter Idaho. You guys yeah. got up and running pretty quickly there, right? So, so how's it going? It's going great. Yeah. So we're about 120 days in. Idaho has been the best launch that we've had. We've done like four different markets now. So we started San Diego and then went to Arizona and then LA was like a big launch for us. So we kind of considered that like a new market. And then Idaho was our fourth market. So we had the systems and processes kind of in place. And so it was by far the smoothest launch from that perspective. The state of Idaho is fantastic. The people are so nice. Yeah. The retailers are so welcoming. Whereas like we launched in Southern California. You know, big retailers like, if we don't deal with independent wholesalers, we've been burned by them in the past. And so we really had to earn our stripes in a lot of ways. And I think what comes with the pedigree of working with a Columbia is a lot of those doors are opened quickly for you, especially with the chains. And so the retailers have been amazing. The brands have been fantastic. And so, yeah, we're a lot further along than we thought we were going to be. We have 16 time employees now in the state of Idaho. We're, we're now servicing the whole state. Uh, we have like 5,000 points of distribution already in the first 120 days. So, wow. Yeah, we're really, really happy. So far. Cool. Cool. But is there any evolution to the strategy with Columbia, the JV there, like in terms of like what's working and what you guys need to tweak? Because as you kind of mentioned, you, know, you guys are kind of like the super high service level specialty wholesaler and they're like the giant logistical back end warehousing, all, you know, all that stuff. Is is that joint thing working really well or like what can you guys improve, I guess? It's, it's going so well. Yeah. And I think the beautiful thing about our relationship with Columbia is that Chris Defonsi, their CEO, like when we spoke about all of this, he was very clear. He's like, look, look, we want to embrace what Scout is and then we want to enhance the areas where you guys want us to help you enhance. And it is it's like the logistics piece. I mean, they have a really powerful chain team that calls them all these category buyers. So we, we definitely, you know, had some help there, but just learning from them about how to large, you know, service large pieces mm -hmm. of geography because Idaho is some very rural parts of the state. 
And they know how to do that in Oregon and Washington. They know how to make money doing it. So we're just learning a tremendous amount from them. But they've been incredibly hands off in a, in a certain way. But then and whenever we raise our hand, we're like, hey, we'd love some input or some help here. They are like jump in right away and help. So it's been great. It's been really good marriage so far. That's cool. That's cool. And, you know, I have to ask, are you guys looking at any other areas? So, I mean, you do have your hands full, just 120 days in, right? We, we do. We are, I mean, we, we talk a lot about just different strategies and different markets that we could look at in the future. I think right now, with Columbia, and we want to we go deep and get a certain level of market share there and, and make money there. So I think that's the, the initial goal. And then if our relationship works and we'll kind of, to your point, like tweak the model and see what, what works, what doesn't work. And then if other markets are an opportunity, I, I think we'll certainly discuss that with them. So is there like no, a nothing? Oh, on the- oh, nothing. Okay. Sorry. So you mentioned like a certain share. Is there like a certain share threshold that you guys operate, you know, optimally at, or I don't know. If there, you there is. I mean, for me, I mean, in Idaho, I would like to penetrate like at least 50% of the controllable account base and then just really increase our distribution, grow our team efficiencies, you know, become a very profitable business in the state of Idaho. Last year was a change for Scott. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about that. We acquired, you know, a classic, classic distribution in the great region. I mean, that was the biggest thing we've ever done. And then, you know, our, our Arizona business is thriving right now. So it's just, we took on a lot. And I think right now is a really good time for us to focus, not get distracted by shiny objects because they're always out there. Uh, we're just trying to stay disciplined and kind of what we're doing. So, yeah. Well, can you dig in a little more on the classic acquisition? And yeah, how's that going in LA? Like, Cali seems like a tough market right now, you know? So what could you say? It is. California, is, it's a really dynamic time to be a distributor. Breakthrough coming in. I mean, very respected wholesaler, acquiring wine warehouse, and then Reyes, I mean, doing what Reyes does. I mean, they're, they're a very large, very yeah. efficient wholesaler here. And then there's a couple other independent players. So for us, I mean, the Los Angeles piece has been great because it gave us scale. It, could, it got us into every single chain, including the Hispanic chain. So now we can really service any brand that comes to Southern California. We can now service them. And that was really the objective of it was to scale quickly. Because in Southern California, as you guys know, it's, I mean, if you can't service the chains, it, it becomes problematic for when brands get to a certain size. Um, but yeah, the market's tough. I mean, gas is so expensive. Labor is incredibly expensive. I mean, we joke about it all the time, but with our routing, and if your driver misses his exit in rush hour, you just, so it's like, hmm. it's just a, it's a very interesting market, market to navigate. We brought in some really smart people to help us do that. And uh, so far, it's going great. Like we're, we're up, I think, 15% over prior year. That includes the classic brand. So we are growing double digits and it's across the board. It's craft, it's import, it's I mean, we're actually dipping into spirits, not like actual liquor, not just yeah. RTDs. And we're seeing success with it. So the market's kind of open for everyone. Right? Right. Yeah. I was going to ask, I know the classic acquisition brought even more beer into your portfolio, but can you kind of share roughly how your total portfolio breaks down nowadays between beer, wine? I know y'all have some wine too and spirits. Yeah, we're really heavy beer and, and then some beyond beer with like hard kombuchas and ciders and stuff like that. But I would say, I mean, we're like 95% traditional. And then right now, spirits is, is the, probably the biggest emerging category for us. We just started dipping into spirits and then we'll probably do like 3 million in sales for spirits. and actual. So yeah, right now, I mean, we're still really heavy, like kind of traditional beverage in the, in the sense of like beer, cider, amount of sensory. So your new partners, as of late, would you say they fall more under the spirits category? Some of the new spirits, yeah, but but beer as well. Okay, um, it's it's interesting. Like I, I keep reading a lot about how craft is is hurting, and I think the regional and the bigger regional and the national craft brands are hurting. Our local crafts are on fire. I mean, they're mm-hmm. everyone is up strong double digits. We see a lot of growth. The category buyers are giving you know shelf space back from seltzer. They're taking it away from seltzer. They're giving it back to craft beer. So we got a lot of new placements in the spring resets that are coming up in the chain. So we're, we're seeing really healthy craft trends and we own a craft brewery in Berlin. So, I mean, Harlan was up 50% last year and we'll do 200,000 cases through wholesale in Southern California this year. And we expect that. Number. I don't know. I think the, the future is bright uh, for craft. I think cider is seeing a nice turnaround. The one that's really surprised us because we didn't have any prior to the acquisition of classic is imports. So we have a couple of import brands that are absolutely on fire for us right now. Some of South America. And we have a brand called Formosa. It's from Guatemala, and and that stuff is on fire. We're now Antonia is from Nicaragua. Literally, we're just trying to get containers in, like just keep ordering containers. So, and then the European imports, we have Dougal and, and 
from those brands, and, and we're doing really well with imports. So I think imports have seen a nice comeback. Huh. Let's back up. Jeff, What? tell me a little bit of your history in the industry and how you got where you are now. Yeah, so I started, actually, I started my, my career at Crest Beverage here in San Diego, and I was a Red Bull band rep. That was my first job out of college. Uh, right. So I did that for a couple of years, and then I got went over to Boston Beer. And that's like kind of where my, I really cut my teeth in the alcohol industry. So got a ton of good training from Boston Beer. Loved my experience. I was there for about seven years, managing parts of Southern California, and then the, ultimately the Pacific Northwest is kind of where I was with them. So really got a good understanding of both resellers. And then I went to PepsiCo after that. And I was only there for about 18 months. And, and for me, I realized like, selling soda is not something I'm very passionate about. But I, what I did learn is at yeah, Pepsi, you get a good financial training there. I mean, it's all about the P&L and how you move money through that organization. And so I got some good business experience. And then left there, went to Coronado Brewing, where I was a national sales director. For about a year. That's when I met the guy who was starting St. Archer. So went over there, and that was my first kind of entrepreneurial endeavor, where I actually got like equity in the company and, and got to build a go to market strategy. And you guys kind of St. Archer after that. It was it was a one two years, and we exited oh. the prison. That was a huge learning experience. But then I got a taste of like what you know, building a business is like in this entrepreneurial lifestyle, which like you say, I look like a spring chicken. I literally feel like I'm like 200 in six years, but we're having so much fun with it. And yeah. So with St. Archer, we had a great exit. And then I think when we, after I was at St. Archer for about a year, that was when I was like, I really want to start a distribution company. I was looking around. And there was just, you know, not that many people servicing the middle tier. And, and even still, I mean, if you guys, it's kind of it's sad looking and embarrassing, but if you saw my office right now, there are boxes of samples that just show up here every day because there's so many brands that are looking for a home. And we try to get to every single one of them, but like Arizona, people are like, why'd you go to Arizona? And it's the duopoly of Anheuser-Busch and Miller Coors is so strong there with from a distributional perspective. And there was no one really servicing the middle tier. So we've been able to make major inroads. So yeah, so we just raised some capital and that's kind of what brought me here. Sorry, long long answer to a short. No, part. that that's what I wanted to to yeah. kind of get the landscape because our listeners may not know. And, and you're, gosh, you're right, Boston Beer, what a great training ground, and PepsiCo. It's interesting because we are seeing more duopolies in more markets, and there is really that need for that third distributor. Whether you know, sometimes wine and spirits will fill that role, or mm-hmm. soft drinks, or whatever. But in some markets, especially chain markets, it's, it, it is real important. The, you know, of course, the problem is is drop sizes. It's all very formulaic, is it? If you cover as many counts as you can, but still maintain that drop size to to not lose money. It's been a while since I've been in the game, but is is that still like managing that still a, a challenge? It is. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We have accounts that like, Jeff. Great news. We just got into you know fifty convenience stores and i'm like that's awesome and then but it's like one skew and so you i mean you know we're going to lose money on every single one of those drops and so where i think the industry is going to go and i think you guys are already starting to see it is these strategic partnerships like i think what we're doing with columbia is just like i hope it's like just on the forefront of happen. but you know what chris Stefanti and i talk about a lot is like why can't we live where there's like the major league team which would be like a columbia and then we're the triple a team developing the talent but if it could all be owned by the same entity you know, we would dominate the, the on-premise and the gourmet grocery and the channels. Whereas like, hey, if you get into like a thousand C stores and you want service in every single grocery store seven days a week, you get punted up to the majors. You know what I mean? But, but it's all right. part of the same family. So it, and who wins in that scenario? The brands. Like, because then you're then you're winning in every single channel, which is right now, you most distributors, I mean, with Scout included, I mean, you don't win in every single channel. And so, but if right. you find a world that that works in, it's really powerful. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's an interesting model. It's kind of the taking the best of both worlds where smaller distributors, more hand selling, more time with the accounts, more information about the brands that you're carrying. Whereas, you know, big distributors, it's a volume game. Let's get cases out the door, build big displays and chains. And you can get that scalability, but also get the hand selling at the at the same time. And I think that's a that is an interesting model and is Oh, I guess Jen already asked you about expansion. So Jen, go ahead with, uh, I've got mine. Yeah, no, I I think we've covered a lot, but I'm curious, you kind of mentioned it before, Jeff, but if you could dig in maybe a little more, you know, across your entire footprint, the markets that you operate in, Idaho Mm -hmm. versus California versus Arizona, like what are the major differences in how you guys go to market? What are the speed bumps and what are the opportunities? Yeah, I mean, so 
ironically, it's odd as we started looking into it, but Arizona and Idaho are very similar. I mean, they're both a little, little bit smaller. I mean, but they're Idaho from all of our research is like the fastest growing state in the country. Mm. Arizona is the second fastest growing state in the country. Where are all those people coming from? A lot of them are coming from California. Like, so a lot of people are leaving California to go to these two states. So they're looking for more options of, you know, better craft beer and cider and everything else. And it's like, oh, we just happen to have a lot of those brands in the portfolio. So, you know, Idaho and Arizona are both cash states. So from a cash flow perspective, they're much easier to manage. And then, but the, the, the strongest similar between the two states of Arizona and Idaho is that they're both really, really chain heavy. Uh, so it's not like this big independent off-premise channel that you could just go out and build business in. So for us, our on-premise share in Idaho and Arizona is massive. We have hmm. a ton of, like, I think we do like 65% of business in Arizona and Arizona still. But if you guys have ever been to like Scottsdale or Phoenix or Tucson, there's like bars everywhere. And so, oh, yeah. Um, and so it's great. So I think it just takes a little bit longer to build your brand portfolio into the bigger chains. But once you do, if you scale, that's like when you really can take some market share. Whereas, whereas California, I mean, there's thousands of independent liquor stores that you can go sell to that are not controlled by any schematics. And there's the big chain, Total Wines and the you know, gourmet groceries of the world. So it's just a very different markets for sure. And then, I mean, obviously the cost of doing business in California, it's, it is a lot higher than it is in mm-hmm. Arizona and, and Idaho. So. Yeah. I I think you touched on something that most people do not realize and that you're in cash states and how just not, not not just administratively easier because you don't have all this accounts receivable and people getting over their accounts. And what do you do? Do you cut them off? You don't want to be an asshole, blah, blah. And in a cash state, boom, it's cash on, cash on delivery. And there's no worry about it. If they don't have the cash, they don't get the beer. It's just very simple. And that's uh, beautiful. Yeah. From an operating perspective, it's so much easier in terms of like not receivable. And I remember when the day we found out that Arizona was a cash state, our CFO like almost fell out of his chair. It's, Listen, uh, I, I started on a beer truck in Texas, which is a cash state. When I say cash state, it was literally a cash state. Like we had safes on the truck. We just have wads of cash walking out and, you know, we eventually got to wires and, and checks because, I mean, it's terrible to say, but we'd lose a driver a year just getting robbed. And when I say lose, I mean murdered. So it, it was not a, it was kind of a dangerous job. You were like a br- walk, you were, you were driving a Brinks truck without the armor and the guns. Nowadays, I mean, we have like FinTech, we have all kinds of yeah. abilities with checks and stuff. So, I mean, we get very little cash on our, with our drivers. I mean, very little. It's any. So, I mean, it's, it's it's been pretty yeah those states are, are great from that perspective and then and then California I mean it's even though there's difficulties in, in operating here there's like 30 million people in Southern California so there's so much opportunity and I think that's what we're really loving about Los Angeles right now is there is just I mean you could build business there for 50 years and not be in every account I mean there's just so much business so we we look at things optimistically like that and there's always room to grow and be better kind of thing so it's a uh, and it's kind of an interesting dynamic having three states. And so we're just trying to take a page from some of the, the bigger players in the game. And so we have centralized operations here. So we do like all of our routing comes out of out of our you know home office here in San Diego, finance. We do procurement, pricing, marketing. Our director of national accounts is based here. So we do like a shared service, shared services model between our, our different business units is what we call them. Yeah. And it's been really effective for us to centralize all of those things. So oh, I bet. Of- I mean, I you know, Reyes does it, but they're a lot of distributors bigger than you don't, which is, it's just such a no brainer, you know, especially do like your routing and your route account, your accounting and all of that in one place. And I guess y'all just use one route accounting system on the back end to run all the distributorships or do you have, or, we do. okay, that's nice yeah. too. I know some distributors that bought other distributors and they all have different as systems and it's just a nightmare. That's yeah. interesting. We've tried to invest heavy in systems. We just we believe in technology and we believe that technology is smarter than we are. So we we've, we've embraced that from day one. So yeah, we've always had a routing system where it's crazy these days. You can see the trucks on the TV screen, all your trucks on the map of LA, and it's almost like yeah. when you put up a destination in on your phone on your map, it tells you you'll get there in one hour and seven minutes. This tells you like when they will finish their route and be back at the warehouse. And it's it's almost like your phone where it's always like spot on. So it makes that it is a that's amazing. It's cool. Isn't it? I mean, it, you almost feel like Batman, you know, with, with your screens, you know, where, you know, everything that's going on in Gotham. 
when I first officed, this is like 20 years ago, when I started Beer Business Daily, I had this janky office over here and these two Pepsi trucks would pull up every day at about two o'clock and they would just go and play hacky sack in the parking lot for about an hour and a half every day. And it, you know, you can't get away with that anymore. There's no yeah. hacky sack left, which is so, kind of sad, honestly. But yeah, it, there's always eyes on you. Yes. God, I would never make it as a pre-salesman today. I lost my van one time. I don't want to get into all this. Oh my God. I have a follow-up. Well, it's a little bit shifting gears, but hey, Jeff, I'm curious what kind of suppliers you guys are are wanting to take on these days. And are you interested in larger suppliers, like even larger suppliers as well? We are. Yeah. I mean, we, we like both. It's weird. We have this like really weird passion for startup brands. It's just, we, we love that process of, of working with them. And I think that's like the the entrepreneur and me and the rest of my team is like, we want to take something from, from nothing and help them scale through the three-tiered system. Because a lot of what we've learned is like, well, not, whether they're entrepreneurs and they, did, they just raise money and like co-pack somewhere, or if they're a startup brewery, is they've never worked in the three-tiered system. And there is a method to getting your way to grow. And so it's like, I'm a big sports person. So I use a lot of sports analogies, but like the basic like fundamentals of this business are pretty simple. And if you can master those, you'll beat probably 50% of your competition. And so I take a lot of pride and joy in sitting down with these people and like helping them build their go to markets and so does yeah. my team. But then the bigger brands, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's we're working with some pretty, you know, good sized brands now with like we have like Gambrinus, which is you know, Shiner, Shiner Rock and Trumer. We love those brands. St. Killian Imports, which is fantastic as well. So it's like Carlsberg and Cronenberg and uh Rote House and stuff. So we love those brands and they're because they're very sophisticated. They make lives easy in a lot of ways and then we still enjoy the challenge of taking brands from nothing to something so uh, what is it about entrepreneurialism that you love is it the no sleep or you know the non because <laughs> well, no, i do those things <laughs> yeah if that's my wife she would tell you that i probably i complain about it all the time but i don't know there's something about like just building stuff that is yeah. so much fun and we just it's addicting like you get it and you're like oh my god we just took this business from you know like like right now we have we have like 250 employees across three states and i started this business with my college roommate like four and a half years ago if you would have told us that we'd be our be where we are now i mean we would build like there's no way and so we we feel really fortunate and and grateful and it's we just want to remain humble and just keep our heads down and keep working because that's who we are but yeah i didn't i think that's it i just we love seeing other people succeed it's fun that's cool and what about tap handles you able to get your tap handles back oh my gosh no never (laughs) I feel like I feel like it's just an endless money pit. If someone could figure out the tap in thing, I would pay good money. To just you know, I've heard that so many times, and I, maybe we should think of something. We, I mean, there's got to there's got to be an RFID. I mean, just put an Apple tag on everyone. Maybe that's I what know. I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. In dealing with a bunch of startup and emerging brands, I'm sure you get to see like a lot of new segments building. Is there anything that you see right now that is on the verge that you think of becoming something bigger, any sort of new kind of beyond beer segment. Like I know y'all are on the kind of front end of hard kombucha and then that kind okay. of exploded. Anything that you see out there that could be mm-hmm. something bigger? No, not really. I, I think maybe like the micro distillers, I think, I think, I mean, even though that's like liquor, I think it's, it's not really beer, but I think the micro distillers, like, I might see a good run coming here. Just, I think a lot of the bars and restaurants now are starting to adopt some some more local micro distilleries I, I still think there's a runway with you know different types of beer i think imports are on fire rtds are having a good a good run right now we'll see you know how that kind of plays out over the next 18 months and then not really nothing nothing really new shining here so i think i think i still think there's there's runway for hard kombucha nationally i think like san diego there's you know all the biggest brands are based here but i think there's still probably room in that category so yeah it'll be interesting see what happens it's all about your gut health, Jen. That's probiotics, guys. Got it. I know. I'm. I am a hard kombucha drinker. For sure. Show you my fridge right now. <laughs> there you so, go. Yeah. We just don't see many people tackling the middle tier. You know, it's it's all for entrepreneurs. It's it's pretty much focused on the produ- production tier, and I think it's refreshing because we've been there are people that good good marketing good brands that don't fit in the Bud Miller Constellation triumvirate. And especially with the consolidation that's going on, some brands are just left behind. So. Yeah. No, I think 
what I what we're hoping to prove is that there is a world where you can work with someone like a scout and maybe we have an affiliation with someone that, you know, like what we were talking about, like if you have thousand C stores, there there has to be a solution for the brands to win. I think our goal and our, our purpose is to take those brands, and whether they're from inception or maybe they're already bigger brands and we get them in our book, is take them grow and then what's the best thing for brands. And I think that's kind of goes back to my supplier background. So I spent 20 years on the supplier side and it is it's a different game on the distribution side. I can tell you that it's the pace on the distribution side is very intense, it's fast paced, it's incredibly competitive, but it's also addicting because like you start seeing the wins and you go out on the market, you start seeing your brands taking share from the competitors. It's 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 a fun game to be in for sure. That's cool. Real quick, one one quick follow up because you know talk about how competitive it is. One thing that we've been hearing over and over and over are distributors evaluating their own service levels and I guess kind of optimizing their own service levels. Where do you see that going, especially you know in a super expensive market like Cali? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we're evaluating it every month. I mean, I sit down with our CFO and my and my you know my VP GMs for each market, and we're looking at it. And if you know every single day, I'm hearing like Jeff, I need more merchandise. I just need yeah. more merchandise. I need more reps. I, we can't cover these outliers, and so we we are, we're leaning on technology again. So we have a, a portal. It's called EO Marketplace, where our accounts can go in, and it's like. It's incredible. So like 6% of our volume in the state of Idaho is done. It's like people go in on our web store and they just put things in their cart. And it's crazy. What we've noticed is our average drop size is double when people use the portal. Hmm. And I think it's because they shop and they see real inventory and they're just dragging and clicking things and putting it in their cart. So I think, <laughs> I think it's like Amazon. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's, yeah. It's, a, and it's, that, it's fun. I, I was actually about to ask if you had, if you had a web portal and, uh, we do, and we're seeing a really high adoption rate for it. And I think maybe some of these younger buyers and stuff just and, and then it is nice, like maybe for the buyers in these outlier like further communities, they can just put it. It literally once they hit submit, it goes to our warehouse, and we just ping them back and say, "Hey, we're going to deliver it tomorrow for the next day, whatever day it is." And then it just shows up. And it's simple yeah. for them, and and it's like they can see our entire portfolio, so like they don't have to like sit and look through a book or talk to a rep full time. They can just go through drag things over but what we're seeing is is that yeah size is double than yeah. when a rep goes hmm. in which is crazy so you said it and forget it that's like right a george foreman grill or something you know a rotisserie that's it, right metaphors are flying today like bats at sundown <laughs> <laughs> like bats at sundown i just got back from austin so there's many bats and dead bodies in, in town lake i don't know what's going on there but Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come uh, visit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's great. <laughs> bodies and some bats. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Man, I was going to go swimming in town like this weekend too, but there's just too many dead bodies. It's gross. Um, all right. Well, guys, thank on you for note. being on, <laughs> on that, on that happy note, Jeff, thanks for being on. It sounds like you got a good thing going and I'd love to check in with you periodically and see how it's, how it's moving along. Appreciate you being on the Beer Net Radio, and I hope honestly that all your dreams come true. Thank you. I appreciate. It. Thanks so much for having me. Very humble. Right. Appreciate you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Take care. All right. Take care. Have a great day. Cheers. You-